free liquor. Um, I'm going over. Going over. You can bring your chair with you if you like. I'm only going to talk for under 10 minutes. And it's a very, very important talk that I have to give. And hopefully if someone brings me some champagne or a margarita, I'll sound a great deal better. Um, Tracy's getting Tracy, yeah. getting people for you, Ralph. So I know there are more than seven people in this room because we went through more than seven drinks. <laughs> Excuse me for not standing. My name is Ralph Hunter and I'm here representing the African American Heritage Museum. We're very fortunate to have two great donations to the museum. We received last year the estate of Ted Theodore Young, or Theodore Ted Young. Ted passed away last summer. Come on, look at him. You don't have to hold it, but you can sit right there and I think. Wow. Um, uh, Ted was a teacher in the Philadelphia school system, and he was also very instrumental in working in the Philadelphia Art Museum. At the Philadelphia Art Museum, he was a long time docent. If anyone doesn't know what a docent is, raise your hand and I'll show you how not to break it. <laughs> D O C E N T. It's called docent. That's a person who um, is a presenter. You might know them better as a presenter. But in a museum setting, a docent is a person who studies the material coming into the museum and can take you on tour. We train more than 100 docents a year here at the museum. Because part of the museum travels, and we travel to schools and universities in three different states. And we take their best and brightest students. This year we're going to be using 21 from each one of the schools when we go there with the traveling museum. And they actually give the exhibit, as opposed to me sitting down like this giving the exhibit. The kids actually get it. So we take over the auditorium, or the gymnasium of the school, we set up 21 different stations there. And each <coughs> different student is responsible for four or five items. They study this information, they go online, and they get additional information, and they learn about, let's say, Marion Anderson. She was from Philadelphia. She was an opera singer. She sang at the, the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to give her an opportunity to sing at Constitution Hall. She eventually sang at the Lincoln Monument. There were 250,000 people at the monument. Her house is still in Philadelphia. There's a Marion Anderson Society. There's now Marion Anderson Busk. Uh, so this kind of information takes a student who knew absolutely nothing about Marion Anderson and able to tell a story and remember that story the rest of their lives. Yes. Because they have to say it over and over and over and over and over and over. Every three and a half minute, minutes, another group of kids come in front of that particular person and they move around. And that's how they learn about Mary Davis or what Patrick Douglas or whether it's one of our great African American leaders. This information stays in their mind. And they can recall it whenever they'll tell their kids about it. They'll start taking their kids to the museum and send them to the movies. And send them to roller skate. You know, wherever they take them these days, you know, take them and give them some culture. And I think we can culturalize our, our students at a young age and take them to Philadelphia or take them to New York to a museum such as a setting or even a play or an opera. It's things that they will learn at these things. It's all part of the arts. The arts are not just something you see hung on the wall. Fred Bacon, who we're going to be talking about in a couple of seconds, was a dancer. He was an art teacher. He was the director of the whole art department 
of the city of Philadelphia school systems, which means he had more than 250 schools that he was responsible for. And being the art director of 250 schools, he had an art teacher back in those days in each one of these schools. And one of the teachers that he had was a guy by the name of Teddy. Y'all know little drunk Teddy. You know little drunk Teddy. <laughs> How could we forget? Ted, Teddy was my friend. And sure was Fred Bacon, my friend. And we had the opportunity to do a great deal of uh, libations together, as well as a lot of cussing. These guys are professional cussers. <laughs> Taught me how, to, and his sister sitting right there. Could, could your brother cuss? Yeah, yeah. Cuss you out in a minute. <laughs> and have a drink after he finish. <laughs> With you. <laughs> so anyhow, we're very fortunate to have Fred Bacon's two sisters. If you would just stand up and be recognized. Evelyn and Anne. Both from Pottstown, Pennsylvania. Who called me up to Pottstown, Pennsylvania uh, a few months ago. And they said, Ralph, we want you and the museum to have Fred Bacon's estate, a portion of his estate. We went through and we pulled it out and we put it together. And in the estate were these woodcuts. They're all limited to less than 20. The woodcuts, uh, that when he was alive, sold for anywhere from uh, 400 to $500. Unfortunately, Fred had passed away, and he passed away in 2015 and born in 1926. So what happens to a signed piece of art by an artist who had his kind of credentials? You think they're worth less money, or they're going to attriculate? What happened? Appreciate it. And they, I figured that in one year they'll go from 350 to 500. The next year they'll go from 500 to 1,000. The next year they go from 1,000 to 5,000 because there's only so many pieces around. And once a person buys a piece of art or a signed numbered print, they tend to hold on to it and pass it down in the family. So the family has authorized me to make the prints available at the price when Freddie was alive, which is $350. We have them listed in our brochure at $500. After today is over, all of the prints will be five and $600. Only while the family's here, and the family witnessed me uh, getting uh, $350 as a donation for the prints, will they be available. We have at least two prints of everything that you have on the wall. And anything you select will be between three fifty and four and three fifty and four hundred dollars, right? And four hundred and fifty dollars. So we're saying to you, art is alive. I'm saying to you that art matters. I'm saying to you, if you ever have an opportunity to buy a piece of art from the demise of a an artist who lived many, many years in our region and taught here, I think you would be quite foolish not to invest in this work. Now, um, two years from now, I plan to take a group of people over to Paris for my birthday. Now, we're going to be saving one of each of Freddie's prints. And to take the flight over to Paris, if you buy a piece of his art, so by then, they're going to be worth $1,000 a piece you have an opportunity to have a free plane ride over to Paris. But if you own the piece now, your piece could then come back to the museum and be sold just for people to take the flight. They're not going to be able to go unless they own a piece of Fred Bacon art. That's the only ticket you can buy. You can go get on another airline I can give a rat's ass. But, <laughs> but if you're traveling with the, the Fred Bacon entourage to Paris celebrating my 80th birthday, that's what's going to happen. So I'm giving you a heads up on it now. Um, don't all rush at one time to me and said I need to own a Fred Bacon piece of art. We take a credit card, we'll take your check, we'll even take your damn welfare check. But I think it's important to have invested in a piece of Fred 
Bacon Original Art. They're all hand signed and hand numbered. There are also some pieces on this wall over there. And one of the pieces is another woodcut done by another artist. And it's called The Street Preacher. Now why do I love that piece so much? My father was a, I'm a PK kid, so I come from a line of preachers. <laughs> so it would be very exciting. And my father was a, uh, blew a trumpet in front of a storefront church on Beale Street in Memphis, Tennessee. And he blew it for his father and for people to come into his storefront church. So the way to get the heathens in, he would blow the trumpet and hopefully they will like his music better than Satchmo. And he played suckler music, which was better than, than Satchmo. But by the same token, he came to Philadelphia and was the headmaster, uh, the choir director at the Church of God in Christ in Philadelphia. So when I see a piece of work like that, or see a piece like this here from the Fred Bacon collection, you look at that, what do you see? The white thing, is that lattice work? Or if your family, shut up. Uh, tell, me what, tell me what you see. Just tell me what you see in that piece there. That, what do you see? Great. And what's that tell you? Who's it about? Say it again. Oh, we got some bright kids in it. That's good. Now you have not the max money? <laughs> Is that piece ever priced on it or I haven't priced it yet? No price. Okay. I will be willing, as long as the family is sitting here, to negotiate a price within that whole framework on that white wall setting over there so we can raise money for the museum. Um, um, I'm not going to say that no price will be turned down, but if you come up here acting crazy like you at the dollar store, then you get to step it. <laughs> if you're in the $500 store, maybe we can start to talk. But the museum only stays great because people who visit museums are great. They know the importance of the art. We're very fortunate to have one of the museum's premier our customers come in here tonight and see these prints on the wall, and right away go into his wallet and pull out his, what did he pull out, Valeria? Valeria, what did he pull out? The gentleman who bought a piece of his art. No, what did he pull out of his pocket? How much? No, 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 he pulled out his credit card. He pulled out his credit card. So he bought the very first piece of bacon prints in Atlantic City. He's a local guy, he's a retired, police officer, and he had the wherewithal to invest in Fred Bacon art. Over in this rack over here, there are more prints than Fred Bacon had from museums around the world. they are prints that date back to 1954, and in 1954, Fred collected these pieces. His family made them available to me, and we're going to start negotiating some prices on those. None of them have price tags on them. But if you come up to me and you got a halfway decent line of credit, oh <laughs> 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 shut up. <laughs> we can negotiate one of those pieces as well. You gotta remember the proceeds are coming to the African American Museum so we can fund this museum and be able to keep our doors open and be proud to bring our grandchildren and our children to a place of color. Now, you notice I said a place of color. Um, this is the only African-American museum, the Archina Museums, we have four of them, in the state of New Jersey. You can't go to Camden, you can't go to Newark, you can't go to Trenton and find an African-American museum. But God found a way for this, these museums to be located in Atlantic County and in Atlantic County only. So being a part of Atlantic County, you guys are all from here. I urge you to support the efforts of the African American Museum. You don't have to buy anything, but if you want to write out a check and stick it in our donation, then we'd appreciate that too. Um, it costs a great deal of money to keep um, our doors open, and we have four different museums, none of which are charged to come into. Everything is by a volunteer basis. The um, Philadelphia, the, the New York Station, um, Channel 29 on your television was here this morning. 
They were here all morning, and they were able to come in and film uh, our stereotypes, <coughs> Ted Young and Fred Bacon exhibit. I sit right there in that chair, and they were here for almost three hours. They had a, uh, or their, their team here, uh, and they filmed it, and it's going to be running next week on New York television. So why the hell would they come all the way from New York to Atlantic City to talk about an African-American museum because there's nothing in between? Okay, so you guys are sitting in a piece of history here tonight. We're celebrating our second year of existence here in Atlantic City. The museum opened in, uh, in 19, uh, 2002 at our main museum in, um, in uh, Newtonville, New Jersey. We also have a museum with an exhibit on the boardwalk called Jackie Robinson, where we have his uniform as bad as bug gloves and, and all of the material back Jackie Robinson. So and that was donated to the museum as well. So when you're talking about people having the opportunity for their state to go on and to have a home, a lifetime place for it to be, it's the only answer you can come up with is the African American Museum. We've been doing it. We've been... Um, we're credited for being a, a good host and exhibiting those works of art as many times as possible. So we have um, uh, an open door policy. We're looking for um, volunteers. We're looking for people to help us out. Mm -hmm. But um, more important, if we get the money, we'll hire somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please mention the newspaper article? Yeah, today's Atlantic City Press. Even after that show. Um, today's Atlantic City Press has two pages on the African American Museum. One of the pages talks about Fred Bacon, and the other one talks about Theodore Young. Never, never in a million years can we get the press to come out to an opening of an exhibit. It's like pulling teeth. But God sent them to us three days ago. Three days ago they came, and the article came out today, and the exhibit opened of both Freddie and Teddy today. Now what's that tell you? We doing, must be doing something here. Oh, yes. With no yes. further ado, I'm going to go over to that counter over there. I want you guys to take a look at the exhibit, and pull down and uh, respect the works of Fred Bacon and Ted Young, and respect what I've been able to do. We only have one or two of our board members here. I don't see them right now. But if you're here, can you please raise your hand? Okay. They must be doing other things. Who's that over there? She raised her hand. Okay, my, my daughter Stacy. Okay, great. Um, Stacy, you got two seconds. Do it. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got two, I mean, 20 to Welcome. Please. No, please, Welcome. please, please, please. Don't put her on Please, Teddy. Yes, you know this, but talk more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the African American Heritage Museum. We wouldn't be here without your support. We thank you for your continued support over the years, and our doors are open because of people like you. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and as a treasurer, we welcome your donations. All right. If anyone needs your price list, I have priceless. Is that Joshua? Is he sitting in He's front right of you? There. Okay. Very Would you hand him some priceless, please, Larry? Hand him some priceless behind you on the, in the box behind the desk. Behind the desk. No, behind the desk. You have to get up, honey. It's really on the other side of the box. Gerald Singer was our very per first purchaser, and almost every show we've ever had, Gerald has dipped into his uh, reserves and um, made a purchase, and when he doesn't make a purchase, sometime he'll just come by and write out a check as a donation for me and his lovely wife. Uh, that's the kind of I will say that. this about this museum. If you're in the history, this is one of the best places you can come. I sat in a chair and I read some letters from the 1930s about some people that I actually knew some of them, some of the things that they were doing back during the Depression. I wasn't born, but I'm interested in what's going on. This is worthwhile supporting. 
And ever since I know of it, I've been supporting it. And I wish more people would contribute to support it also. All right. Thank you. Well done. Well done. Thank you, Gerald. You know I love you, and I love the support over the years you've given to the museum. But before leaving, I ask everyone, after they make their purchase, you'll be able to take a picture with me and Freddie's two sisters. Uh, with me wearing my new shoes, my new birthday edition, I have the greatest damn shoes in the world. Three of my great grandkids looked at my feet and said, Poppy, they are girl shoes. They started laughing. They laughed for a half hour. They couldn't wait to call their mother and their father to tell them that Pop Pop had girl shoes on. But I wear them very proudly. They're a present to myself from myself. I couldn't afford them at the Eman Marcus, but I was able to get them online in China. So, um, it, took, it took almost eight weeks for them to get here, but they're the greatest damn shoes I've ever worn. And I'm so proud to have worn them in your company. So I didn't wear them on January the 9th, but I'm wearing them on February the 12th. All right. So if anybody wants to get together and take me out for Valentine's Day. I promise not to wear these damn shoes. I got a red pair coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ralph. Well, congratulations. Keep up the good work. These are Nick Cannon shoes, and that's why I bought them. That's the idea. I call them the Nick Cannon shoe. Nick Cannon, when he comes on stage with these shoes, on, they're so, so classic. Nick Cannon for the guy on television. Thank you.